Hello and welcome to the Lost World Minute, the Minute by Minute podcast reviewing the 1997 sequel Jurassic Park, one minute at a time. I'm Brad. I'm Dave. And today we're talking about Minute 22 of the Lost World. David, how are you? I'm doing good, I'm doing good. I'm going to go for a walk after this out in the woods, capture some the Lost World imagery. Ah, very <laughs> nice, very nice. Yeah, I, um, a couple of weeks ago I went up to a, uh, like a high, high dam or reservoir here, um, up in the hills, and mm-hmm. it just so happened to be raining most of the morning, and, uh, come lunchtime that rain had stopped, and all the, uh, mist and that was rising out of the trees, and managed to get some good footage, uh, very useful sauna-like. Yeah, it did look very cool. Mm. So, I just wish I had been drone up there so I could do some aerial stuff above the, above the treetops, but, uh, oh, yeah. alas, it didn't happen, so... But that was a that was a fun little time away, and it uh, again as we've talked here before, it's just good getting sort of real world real world shots and uh, bending them to our will to become something from the franchise. Yeah, I'll be back in five or six days. No, you'll be back in five or six pieces. Not much news uh, today, so we're going to get straight into this minute. Um, I've got to go to work in about 20 minutes, so <laughs> yeah, right. we won't we won't rush through it. We'll just uh, we'll get into it though. So if you're ready, we'll get into uh, today's episode. All right, let's go. As we enter the 21st minute of Lost World, we got a nice shot of the RVs and the two Mercedes M class driving up a valley, misty hills in the background, and the swell of Malcolm's journey as a score. As we get into the 22nd minute of the Lost World, we get a look at the Marksman GPS that Eddie's holding and the dialogue that they build a tracker into Harding's satellite phone, and they should be getting a reading. Malcolm replies, yeah, I'm so relieved. At 21.15, Nick splits the two up and says over there, sighting Sarah's backpack laying in the stones of a small creek bed. At 21.24, Ian kneels down in front of the backpack and picks it up, sticking a finger through a hole in the front of the backpack, fearing the worst. At 21 minutes and 26 seconds, Malcolm pulls out Sarah's satellite phone, checks it, and puts it back in the pack. 21 minutes and 29 seconds, he starts shouting Sarah's name. Nick also joins in calls for Sarah Harding. 21 minutes and 35 seconds, with a dumb look on his face, Malcolm turns around and faces Nick, asking, How many Sarahs do you think are on this island? The two continue calling out for Sarah once again. At 21 minutes and 39 seconds, Ian's cut off by a sound of crushing in the underbrush. 21 minutes and 42 seconds, we get a shot of Eddie starting to walk away from the group, hearing more of the large animals moving through the jungle. At 21 minutes and 49 seconds, Malcolm asks, what? Eddie replies, something big. At 21 minutes and 53 seconds, we get our first shot, two stegosaurs walking down into the creek bed. They slowly cross the stream, not paying any attention to the three human visitors on their island. And this ends the 22nd minute of The Lost World. Alright, so we get the uh, final of the the vehicles driving up the valley. Now, I know there's been HD Blu-ray versions of this, but because the the film grain's a lot darker on The Lost World, I don't know if you can still see who's actually driving what. Do we know who's driving Uh, the RV and the the two explorers? Or the two M-Class? Yeah, in the deleted scene that we mentioned in the anniversary edition, you can see um, stills from the deleted scene. There's like six stills of it, so we know this whole scene exists out there someplace. You can see it's Eddie truck car driving the RV, and then Nick and Ian are driving one of the Mercedes, respectively. I'm not sure which one. It makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense for Eddie to be driving the RV. He'd have more experience driving a vehicle that large, you'd imagine. Yeah, because you also, you see those, um, you see him parking the vehicles on the cliff mm-hmm. and later getting the uh, gear out, but we'll get to that in a future minute because uh, there is a lot of talk to talk about there. Um, and then we cut to them on foot, uh, Eddie holding the Marksman GPS. Mm-hmm. Um, I, was th- I always thought that was really cool, and I know that there's a, um, on the replica platform, there's a guy... Username is Rymo. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He's from Kansas, and he's he's actually built one. He built a, uh, a whole computer sequence uh, for his marksman, and it was it looks it looks really cool. I'll post it up on the Facebook page. 
Yeah. Was like... Yeah, because um, all as far as as far all, as far as my knowledge goes, as uh, GPS has never done that back in the nineties. It was like mid two thousand before you started to get actual three D mapping mm-hmm. and all that, um, which probably explains why it's so big. And so it can accommodate a uh, LCD screen to actually display the uh, island overlay and then zoom into the creek, which I'd love to be able to get a HD still or sequence of just that that animation. Um, um, there's one in the novel. I can pull that up if you'd like. Oh, okay, yep. Or it's nice. not in the making of, I'm sorry. Yep, okay, I'll get that off you later. That'd be great. But, uh, yeah, we're walking down. It's it's interesting. They've, uh, they've got a tracker in mm-hmm. Harding's satellite phone. Um, I'm guessing there's a tracker in the backpack as well, but it's only mentioned in the in the satellite phone. Um, well, the satellite phone's in the backpack. So. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder I wonder if they picked up that tracker while they were en route to uh, the cliff face, if they went in that direction because they found the uh, signal. Um, like they sort of drove as close as they could and went on foot the rest of the way. Um, yeah, well... In the, um, I think they were were on foot the whole time because they walked back to the camp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they they drive pretty close to where where they find her. It seems. Yeah. yeah. Um, again, it'd just be it'd just great to see a little bit more of them uh, driving, and then as we see later establishing base camp, and um, and then going to find Sarah. Well, I again I have pictures of the um of the undressed version of the uh, that base camp, and I can post pictures when we get to that minute. Yeah, yep. Because they've laid down, like, uh, tons of fake foliage for the floor and pine needles and added ferns and stuff like that. Made it dressed up that whole... It was just a parking lot on um, Patrick's Point State Park that was the base camp. Yeah, well, that, that, that's interesting with the Patrick's Point car park because one thing when you're looking at the set photos, and we'll post some up on the Facebook group this uh, on the Facebook page this week, it does look like they've just gone in and with dump trucks and tipped a whole heap of bark, oh, yeah. um, like it's processed red bark everywhere. <laughs> yeah, they definitely did. It's a it's a very unnatural looking, oh, sort of not unnatural, but it's a weird looking um, ground cover. For what's what's to be jungle or the redwoods. Um, oh, really? When you think about it, it's not really because when you go there, all the dirt is red. All the, dirt well, the is pine red, needles. All the pine needles are, pine needles are yeah. red, and, and because of the pines and the pine needles dropping all the time, everything has all the dirt and it has like this dry red, rust red color to it, just like in the, um, just like in the parking lot there. Yeah, yeah, and we do get before we get to. Uh, Eddie and that going on looking for Sarah. We do get a lot. There's a lot of stills. Um, we know they shot a lot of stuff in that uh, area at where they set up base camp. Mm-hmm. Um, Nick Nick has a heap of uh, camera equipment spread out across the front of an M- MAV. Mm-hmm. MAV yeah. M class. <laughs> um, yeah. Now this is the beauty of Hollywood magic. Is you do not realize that right behind those trees in the background there, at the opposite the cliff face. Well, it's not really a cliff face either, actually. No, <laughs> it's just like a steep hill. Is the game is the game trail? Yeah. So it's like it's there's about five yards of uh, I'd have to say cedar trees, and then you got redwoods and the and the game trail right behind there. It's it's really interesting. Mm. Uh, they're able to transform this little. Uh, several mi- square mile space into what make it feel like it's hundreds of miles away from each other. Or yeah. Not hundreds, but several miles away from each other. Yeah. Yeah, and I, we also get Eddie doing unpacking some equipment too. Mhm. Um. Yeah, it's just another another scene, another sequence I would have loved to see include in the film. Um, yeah. Instead Definitely. of sort of just the rush to go and get Sarah. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's what we've got. Um, they find they find the uh, backpack. Oh no, not backpack. Um, Malcolm's once again knocking technology, um, and mm-hmm. he's holding the rifle, which I found interesting. Again, you'd think that'd be an Eddie 
Eddie or even Nick. Nick's done time in uh, combat. Mm-hmm. Um, True. You'd think one of those would be holding the rifle. More so for safety than accuracy. Yeah. <laughs> Eddie's already said you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot. Mm-hmm. And now, uh, there's also another deleted scene here. It's just a short clip, but we mentioned it in the anniversary special, too, mm. is um, when they come up to that creek edge that we first see them in after the... Um, when they're looking for Sarah, is they is Nick Van Owen brings up, well, maybe we should uh, separate and uh, split up and look for her. And Ian Malcolm shoots that idea down right away. He's like, no, no, that's that's a terrible idea. That's the worst thing you could possibly do. Yeah, yep. And it's only a it's only a five, five or six second clip. Like it's very yeah. short, and it's just the same. Like the um, like Malcolm in Hammond's office. When uh, the five, the four, the four lunatics come up and want you get the National Guard, it's um, it's just something very small. It's filmed. Put it back in there. Yeah, really. It help. It help out so much. It just yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and that's on a be- an exclu- I don't know why this behind the scenes isn't on the DVDs, but it's. I found that it's on YouTube, and I'll post that up too. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. Same as that that um. Malcolm and Hammond's office was only just from. I'm not sure what it is, but it's a uh, really of uh, behind the scenes that we don't get to see that's not on the DVD. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's like the um the stuff in Hammond's office too. It's on that one one certain thing. It was never used. Yeah, never, Betamax. Yeah, never put on uh, any behind the scenes stuff or any mm-hmm. documentaries. It's just ah oh, universal. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, the stuff is spread across so many mediums and so every corners and reaches of everywhere. Yeah, and the the so. worst thing probably is that that stuff doesn't exist. They probably don't have the negatives or have that stuff anymore, and that's probably yeah, that's why. True. But um, we get Malcolm calling Eddie Doc, which is the only time, which is a good callback to the novel. Even though Eddie wasn't Doc in the novel, that was Doc Fawn. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it was Eddie that used to call Fawn Doc all the time and not Malcolm. But, yeah. um, nice little callback. Uh, Nick sees the backpack first. And mm-hmm. if, if, if we're going to, uh, say the Avery sequence in Jurassic Park 3 is a callback to Jurassic Park, well, this is certainly a callback to The Lost World where they're, uh, driving the vehicles to find Richard Levine and driving to the lab and they come across the creek and here's a, uh, a torn backpack sitting in the mud. Mm-hmm. This isn't so much on the mud. It's uh, as we'll see. Sarah's just dropped it to go and take some photos. But um, her uh, her lucky pack has got a hole in it. Pokes his finger through it mm-hmm. and um, pulls out the phone, checks it, and puts it back. That a line. If they'd said the battery's dead, it would have been it would have been fine because this backpack sits. Oh, this phone sits in her backpack the entire movie. Uh-huh. <laughs> as, as far as we know, which I know, I, I realized that like a couple years back. I'm like, wait a second, is the phone dead or no? Because if it's not, they had a satellite phone in that backpack the entire time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it, like you can understand. Okay, the whole whole start of the movie, they can't get onto her because if you're on the island like that, should know working with predators, you don't just have your phone on in your backpack where it can go Mm -hmm. off at any time um it'd be turned off so it Mm -hmm. wouldn't be using battery power now if she's been there a week and hasn't used it um again trying to think back to late 90s cell phone technology how the how long the batteries would last with it even turned off but i still think you'd be able to get a call out at least she was even there for a week though i'd i'd give it two or three days she was there yeah 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 which, again, on how'd she get there? I would have loved to see some of that. Yeah, I wrote a fan fiction um, about uh, her time while she was on the island before the others arrived. Yep. Uh, very nice. Is that online somewhere? It is, yes. It's on um, Jura- Jurassic mainframe forums. I'll, I'll post it up on the uh, Facebook page. Yep, okay. Nice. Cause yeah, it's sort of interesting. We got we got comics for uh, Eric Kirby's adventures on Sauna later on for Jurassic Park Three, mm-hmm. but um, it would have been just nice for uh, Sarah 
Because she only had that lucky backpack, so as far as I know, she's sleeping under palm fronds and or in a tree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, really. Yeah. Even even food, like she'd be on ration packs or something. Yeah, no. well, that's right. right. Uh, she had plastic wrap, wrapped sandwiches, like in the novel, and that uh, she had like a wool blanket stuffed in that bag. Yep, yep. Which you have. You have the version of that bag, as we were discussing previously. Yeah. Just without the uh, the hole cut in it. <laughs> Actually, I do. I did uh, snip a couple of holes into it. Oh. To make a, uh, I used screen caps for the placement. Mm. For the holes, and I snipped a couple holes into it. Took uh, some steel wool and coarse grain sandpaper and just kind of roughed up the edges a bit. Yep. Make it look a little bit more worn. Yeah, add that add that um, wear to it. Yeah. Mm. And I suppose it's um it could when he sticks his finger through the hole, it's not really a big hole. Um, no, it's not. Well, the backpacks in the first place isn't that big, and, and it's really actually kind of small. It just looks big on Juliana Moore because she's small. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The um, because I, I I was sort of thinking to start with, okay, maybe he's shown it's got a hole in the bag. Maybe the phone fell out the hole at a later later stage, maybe in the RV or something. But um, it's only big enough for him to stick his finger through to make it look like or come across as if she's been attacked. Which, a hole in the bag doesn't necessarily point to that. If there's straps torn off it or a slice in it or something, you might think she'd been attacked. But uh, that's mm-hmm. just Ian, Ian uh, over-exaggerating. And another another little funny moment here. They start calling out for Sarah, Sarah Harding. How many Sarahs do you think are on this island? Yeah, yep. <laughs> And as we'll see, as we'll see later, sort of a callback when Nick, uh, when Ian starts doing it, but Nick's not there to correct him. Um, mm-hmm. But that was, that was a great little line from Malcolm. Yeah. Um, and uh, he continues shouting and uh, cuts himself off, and we hear crushing under the underbrush. Um, mm-hmm. Interesting, we don't hear the crushing under the underbrush until Malcolm, they stop yelling, so we don't actually hear it when Malcolm hears it, but. Um, what is it? Something big, Eddie says. Mm-hmm. And I mean, um, if you were asked to be a triceratops, don't know. Yeah. Yep. And I think uh, that sudden look of realization on Malcolm's face to realize they've just been shouting at the top of their lungs. Mm-hmm. Um, which someone else gets pretty uh, condemned for in a later film. But um, yeah, if we get uh, the the uh, reveal of the stegosaurs. Just. Yeah, in, yeah. In yeah. Can I just say that this was probably one of my favorite parts of the scene in general was the the first reveal of them just crossing the riverbed. It, 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 I've always loved it as a kid. I always and it's always stuck in my mind of this dried up creek bed where you might find dinosaurs there. You know. Yep. So I've always kind of um, gone for my photography of pictures like that of dried up creek beds in the middle of a forest where you get that kind of feel from it where you're just surrounded by walls of green and this little trickle of a stream and how you could you don't know what's beyond those walls of green you know mm. it's got this air of mystery to it yep and I love how they're just standing in the water the the human characters are standing in the water uh-huh, exactly. Which shoes like they're, they're oblivious to their surroundings. They're just in awe of what's uh, happening, and they sort of emerge, emerge, and don't really pay much notice to them either. Mm-hmm. Whereas you'd think something would come out, and especially after them yelling, um, yeah. would come out and be attracted to the noise. Where not they're just wandering through uh, through the jungle. Mhm. And that's uh, another thing I always loved about the Lost World was how the characters are just. They don't care about the nature. They immerse themselves. They go after it. They they just go for it. They don't care if their shoes get wet. They don't care if their clothes get wet. They don't care if they get muddy. They don't... They It's like they're having fun out there. Well, yeah. not really. But something my mom always used to tell me was, it doesn't matter how dirty you get as so long as you have fun. Yeah, yep. That's kind of what it always reminded me of. Mm. 
said I used to come home muddy and covered and <laughs> you know, yep, fully covered head to toe. Yeah, yep. <laughs> and you'd be in trouble, but you had fun. You had fun doing it. Yeah. Uh, yep. Take your shoes off before you go in the house. <laughs> Mm. All right. Uh, anything else you want to bring up from this minute? I think we're good. All good. All right. All right, guys. Let's get the hell out of here. Contact details are on the website, thelostworldminute.com. You can email feedback to thelostworldminute at gmail.com. Facebook, The Lost World Minute. Twitter, at The Lost World Minute. And Instagram, The Lost World Minute. Easy to remember. Yeah, yeah, very easy to remember. Right. <laughs> uh, David, thank you for joining me. For this record and uh we'll be back i've been brad i'm dave and uh we'll talk to you all later Goodbye. talk to you later bye it is absolutely imperative that we work with the costa rican department of biological preserves to establish a set of rules for the preservation and isolation of that island these creatures require our absence to survive, not our help. And if we could only step aside and trust in nature, life will find a way.